everyone! Welcome to my office. I'm Peyton, and I'm an explorer. Are you an explorer? Well, all you need to be a great explorer is the willingness to learn, an imagination, and the ability to ask questions. Today, I'm going to take you on a wonderful adventure to Mill Mountain Zoo, where we'll learn about endangered and threatened species. Are you ready to go? Don't forget to follow along today with your explorer passport. If you don't have one yet, you can go to Center in the Square's On Demand page and download a free passport today. Let's go, explorers! Hi, welcome to Mill Mountain Zoo. My name is Bambi Godkin and I'm the education manager here. I am going to take you on a tour today and we are going to talk about some of our threatened, vulnerable, and endangered species. Now to better understand endangered species, you need to look at an organization called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They do research on plant and animal species to decide um, what risks they face, what their populations are, and they assign them a status based on that information. Um, the most serious status, of course, is extinct in the, extinct means there aren't any left, um, and it goes from extinct in the wild to critically endangered, and we're gonna talk about critically endangered species with our red wolves here, and then endangered and vulnerable all the way down um, as threats become less severe or the population is very, doing very well um, to a species of least concern, which means they're very plentiful. So that is what we're gonna talk about with uh, five of our animals here in the collection. We're gonna start with an animal that was recently listed as near threatened and down listed to a species of least concern. So it's a great conservation story. So the first stop on our tour are going to be the palace cats. And palace cats are a small species of cat found in the mountains of China, Mongolia, and other parts of Asia. They have a color um, that helps them blend in very well with the rocky terrain that they are found in. They're ambush predators, so they sneak up on their prey and they're able to do this very effectively because they have a very wide forehead um, and very and flat and wide spaced ears. So they can peep over rocks without any animal seeing them. And then when they see a rodent or other animal they want, they can pounce on it. Now the palace cat um, was, as I mentioned earlier, recently uh, downlisted from near threatened to a species of least concern. Um, and there are some reasons for that. So we didn't know a lot about them. They're very elusive in the wild. And there was a lot of research happening on snow leopard conservation. And we kept catching palace cats on the cameras that were put out meant to do snow leopard research. And through that, they were able to find out that a lot of these guys, they're more uh, widespread, their population is more robust. We were able to find out all kinds of things about their behavior and breeding season, the things that we didn't know before. Um, so that was really exciting. They're also protected in most of their range. Um, Mongolia is the only place that allows um, legal hunting of the palace cat. Um, so that helps them out as well. Um, the let me just, <laughs> I feel like I forgot something. <laughs> da, da, da. Da, 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 da. Okay, oh yes. The palace cat also has a very robust breeding program in captivity. Um, and in the last several years, there have been a number of palace cat births at various facilities, including Mill Mountain Zoo. Um, the ones that we have on display here, Bat Bayar and Norbu, were born here about four years ago. Um, and so we're very ha happy to have contributed to that conservation success story. The next step on our tour is Bali, our snow leopard. Uh, snow leopards are found in high elevations, uh, 4,000 to 15,000 feet in uh, the mountains of China, uh, Myanmar, Nepal, and they have a great coat coloring that helps them blend in in both rocky and snowy terrain that they would find there. Um, they are listed as a vulnerable species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, some of the reasons they do actually share uh, with Palace Cat um, for that, that ranking, and that is um, a decrease in prey population. So due to climate change, a lot of the um, predators' natural prey populations have dropped. Um, these guys eat a lot of ungulates or hooved animals in the wild, um, and climate change has really impacted their population as well as some of the smaller rodents and prey that Palace Cats eat. Now in the case of the snow leopard with less ungulates to eat, 
they have started to they prey on um, livestock, domesticated livestock. Um, because to a snow leopard, a tame goat or sheep at a farm is no different than one that they are going to find in the wild in the mountains. And of course, domesticated ones are going to be easier to catch. So unfortunately, um, because of that, there have been a lot of retaliatory huntings um, by the farmers. Um, you know, we'll kill the snow leopards because the snow leopards have taken their livestock. So that is a serious problem. Um, they've also historically been hunted for their fur because they do have such beautiful pelts. At one time, snow leopard pelts could go for $50,000. Um, they also have been used for traditional medicines um, as a substitute for tiger parts. So tigers became less and less common and more endangered, and so people started to use the equivalent snow leopard parts in those traditional medicines. So that was an issue as well. Now luckily there is an organization called the Snow Leopard Trust and they do a lot of research and they also do a lot of education and outreach in the communities in the mountains um, to teach them about the importance of snow leopards to the ecosystem and ecotourism and to give the villages alternative means of making money. And through that, they've been very successful um, in promoting the importance of the snow leopard. They have recently been downgraded from endangered to vulnerable, so that is really great news for the snow leopard. The next stop on our tour is Nova, our red panda. The red panda is found in China, Myanmar, and Nepal in bamboo forests at high elevations. Um, they are listed as an endangered species um, by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Their population is estimated to be about 10,000 in the wild, which may seem strange that they would be listed as an endangered species, but snow leopards, who have a population of only 35 to 6,500, would be listed as a vulnerable species. Now, the reason uh, for that is the threats that, that the red panda faces are thought to be more serious, and also the um, relation to predator-prey populations. Uh, prey animals typically do have a larger population than your predators, so that would be a normal thing to see in the wild. Now some of the threats that these guys face, the um, most serious one, is habitat fragmentation and habitat destruction. So um, bamboo forests periodically die off, and when you have fragmented habitat areas, when that bamboo growth dies off, it makes it very hard for red pandas to make it to new feeding grounds. So that's a serious problem. As awareness of the species has entered the public um, consciousness, they have also become popular as pets, so they are collected in the wild for that as well. And they are hunted for their fur. They have a very beautiful coat color, um, and they are hunted, unfortunately, for bush meat as well. One of the more recent developments is actually canine distemper. As uh, people move more and more into those mountainous regions that the red panda lives in, red pandas are coming in contact with domesticated dogs more frequently. And canine distemper, unfortunately, is lethal if red pandas do get it. Bamboo makes up 75% of the red panda's diet in the wild, so that is why it is such a serious issue if they are not able to get from one feeding ground to the next when that bamboo growth dies off. The next step on our tour are our red wolves. Red wolves are critically endangered in the wild and are the most endangered canid in the world with a very um, roller coaster like conservation story. So the red wolf was exterminated um, primarily due to fear. Um, wolves, of course, historically have been feared by humans, whether just or unjust, in the case of red wolves, very unjust. Um, and it's just misinformation and um, you know, not being educated on the facts. Unfortunately, that fear did lead to a lot of extermination of red wolves and other wolf species throughout the world. Um, they've also been victim to habitat destruction, fragmentation, and vehicle uh, fatalities as well. In uh, the early 1980s, there were only 17 red wolves left in the wild, and all 17 were removed, they were declared extinct in the wild, and a captive breeding program began. The captive breeding program is very important because we want to keep their genetic line pure, and they are able to interbreed and hybridize with coyotes. So the captive breeding program is meant to keep that from happening, and so to grow that population in safety. Now, after some time and the wild population was large enough, they began to look for areas to reintroduce the red wolf back into its original range. And red wolves were originally found from Pennsylvania 
down to Florida and west to Texas. So they had a very large range in the southeast United States and were the areas, one of the area's top predators. And the loss of the red wolf, as well as other predators like the cougar, uh, has led to the overpopulation of white-tailed deer. And so it's very important that we, have, that we maintain that predator-prey ratio to keep those uh, prey populations in check. Now, they did not do well in many of the places that they were reintroduced, but they did very well in North Carolina and the Alligator River Wild Refuge. Um, so well, in fact, that they kept adding additional land, um, bombing sites, uh, public lands, and even some private property to where they had 1.7 million acres to roam uh, in their original range. Now, after time, there were actually 100 to 150 of them at the height of this program about a decade ago. But then unfortunately, the conservation story takes a bad turn. And that is again due to fear on, of the humans. Now, red wolves are a lot different than gray wolves in that they are very shy and secretive. Um, they're not bold, they have very small packs, they do not have the large packs that gray wolves have, and they don't want to have anything to do with us. So they really pose no threats to humans at all. But those fears, um, again, had entered into the communities where the red wolves were roaming, and through human interference and intervention, the wild population is now down to less than 30. Um, so it's very unfortunate. However, um, through the wild and um, captive populations, there are about 260 total red wolves in the world, um, nine of which live here at Mill Mountain Zoo. Um, so we are very happy that we have such a large population of the few remaining red wolf species. And we have had over the years some actually born here as well. The last stop on our tour are our Bur Burmese pythons. And you may have heard of Burmese pythons uh, in the news because they are an invasive species in the Everglades in Florida. Um, the problem in Florida is actually so severe that biologists think there may be a tipping point where Burmese pythons may overtake the American alligator as the top predator in the Everglades. Um, so it's a huge problem for us here in the United States, but in Asia, where these guys are native to, they are actually listed as a vulnerable species. Um, one of the reasons for that is habitat destruction. Um, the Burmese python does well in a number of habitats. They'll do, you know, hang out in mountains and forested areas, but they really love wet areas like swamps and marshes and rivers. And unfortunately in Asia, 45% of the wetlands have been drained for agriculture and development or have been polluted. Um, so that is a serious problem for the Burmese python. They are also hunted both for meat uh, and for their leather. Um, they do have very beautiful skin um, that is unfortunately used for leather products. And they are collected in the wild for the pet trade as well. Now, some people will ask me uh, why we can't collect the Burmese pythons that are overrunning the Everglades and send them back to Asia um, you know, to help bolster the population there. The problem with that is that these are very large snakes. Um, they can get up to 20 feet long and 200 pounds. So shipping something that size is just not practical. But additionally, um, the Everglades in Asia are gonna have very different microbes, um, bacteria and, and parasites, diseases. And if you take the snakes from the Everglades and send them back to Asia, you could potentially introduce those um, to the native population and, and decimate it. So that is not something that we would want to do, obviously. Thank you for joining me today to learn about some of the threatened species that live at Mill Mountain Zoo. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has actually identified 40,000 plant and animal species that are on the red list, and over 16,000 of those are endangered. And there's a lot that you can do to help. Welcome back to my office, explorers. I hope you enjoyed your time at the zoo. I sure did. It was really great to learn about all the good work they're doing with the Red Wolf Recovery Program. Make sure to write down everything you learned today in your own Explorer Passport. If you don't have one, you can download one on the On Demand page on Center in the Square's website. Special thanks to the Truist Foundation for making sure everyone who wants to learn can. Please continue asking questions, explorers, and I'll see you next time.